Hey everyone, Will here. So for today's video, we are going to be analyzing the ninth presidential election in American history. That means we're going to be going over all aspects of this race, including the context of the race, the candidates in the race, and the result of the race. So without further ado, let's begin. So the ninth presidential election in American history took place from November 1st, 1820 to December 6th, 1820, spanning over the course of 35 consecutive days. Similar to the previous presidential elections in American history, the telegraph was still not invented yet, which made it difficult to transmit information across the country effectively. So the ninth presidential election in American history saw incumbent President James Monroe successfully run for re-election, completely unopposed, with the few remaining members of the Federalist Party failing to nominate their own candidate. This made George Washington and James Monroe the only two presidents in American history to run for re-election unopposed. At this time, James Monroe was extremely popular among voters during a time that became known as the Era of Good Feelings. This was a moment of national unity that swept across the United States after the conclusion of the War of 1812. Despite this unity, there were some concerns that Americans had due to the Panic of 1819 and increasing conflict over the issue of slavery following the passage of the Missouri Compromise. Ultimately, however, Neither the Panic of 1819 nor the Missouri Compromise had any major impact on the uncompetitive election of 1820. Since James Madison's renomination as the Democratic Republican nominee for president was never in question, very few Democratic Republicans even decided to attend their nominating caucus, with only 50 of the 190 Democratic Republican members of Congress attending. Even though the Federalists were unable to nominate a candidate for president, they did officially nominate a vice presidential candidate named Richard Stockton, who was one of America's original founding fathers. Meanwhile, the Democratic Republican Party renominated Daniel D. Tompkins as their party's vice presidential nominee. This election was notable for marking the last time that the Federalist Party would participate in a national election in the United States. Since James Monroe and Daniel D. Tompkins were at such an advantage in this contest, there was virtually no campaigning in the lead-up to the election. An unanticipated factor in this election was the passage of the Missouri Compromise, which made the region of Maine, formerly a part of Massachusetts, a free state to allow for the admission of Missouri, which was labeled under the law as a slave state. Election controversies soon emerged when legal challenges were directed at the newly made Missouri Constitution. These challenges proclaimed that the Missouri Constitution violated the United States Constitution for denying free African Americans the right to reside in the state, since Article 4, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution guarantees citizens of each state the rights of citizenship in all states. These legal disputes lasted over two months, and by the election of 1820, they presented a problem for Congress. If the U.S. Congress counted Missouri's votes, then it would be an affirmation to the legitimacy of the Missouri State Constitution. Meanwhile, if Congress did not count Missouri's votes, then it would be a refutation to the legitimacy of the Missouri State Constitution. The U.S. Senate was well aware of this controversy, and therefore passed an unprecedented resolution on February 13, 1821, stating that two national tallies of the total vote would be taken, both a tally with Missouri included and one with Missouri excluded. The President of the Senate would then announce both tallies before Congress. This strategy proved ineffective at avoiding criticism, as seen by an objection raised to the votes from the state of Missouri by New Hampshire Congressman Arthur Livermore. Congressman Livermore objected that because Missouri had not yet officially become a state, it had no right to any electoral representation. This argument was met by a rebuttal statement by Virginia Congressman John Floyd, who argued that the state of Missouri's votes must be counted. Despite these protests, the resolution for the election was followed as passed prior. 
Other strange occurrences also happened regarding the Electoral College as well. Massachusetts was entitled to 22 electoral votes, but only cast 15 in the 1820 election, since Maine, which was formerly a region of Massachusetts, was granted statehood. Likewise, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Mississippi all casted one fewer electoral vote than they were each granted, since one elector from each state had died before the electoral meeting. These three instances of missing electoral votes during the 1820 election mark one of only three elections in which any state or district has casted under the minimum of three electoral votes, with Nevada casting less electoral votes in 1864 and the District of Columbia casting less electoral votes in the year 2000. Additionally, the presidential election of 1820 was the first presidential election to include the states of Alabama, Illinois, and Mississippi as well. The final results of the election came in as expected by the vast majority of Americans. Coming in first place were both James Monroe and Daniel D. Tompkins of the Democratic Republican Party, with James Monroe winning a total of 231 electoral votes. Only one elector voted against James Monroe. This rogue elector was former U.S. Senator William Plummer, who instead casted his vote for Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. The remaining three electoral votes, as mentioned before, were not counted, since these electors had all died before the election took place. While James Monroe received all but one casted electoral vote, it should be noted that several Federalist electors still opted to vote for Richard Stockton for Vice President, with Stockton winning a total of eight electoral votes. Likewise, all four Delaware electors voted for former Delaware Governor Daniel Rodney for Vice President. In addition to this, Maryland Senator Robert Goodloe Harper and U.S. Minister to the United Kingdom Richard Rush each received one electoral vote for Vice President, respectively. It is also paramount to point out that this was the first election in which the Democratic Republicans won the states of Connecticut and Delaware in a national election, marking the dominance of their political party nationwide. In terms of the popular vote, James Monroe and Daniel D. Tompkins resoundingly won the election, receiving 80.61% of the popular vote. Other notable sums of the popular vote went to John Quincy Adams, who won 2.04% of the popular vote. Meanwhile, DeWitt Clinton also won 1.75% of the popular vote. Another 1.53% of the popular vote went to unpledged electors, with the remaining 16.12% of the popular vote not going towards any candidate. With only 1.34% of the population voting, a lot of the country was prohibited from voting, including almost all African Americans, women, and non-landowners. At the same time, more and more states were now using the popular vote to select electors, with 15 of the 24 states choosing electors through using a method of popular vote. Thank you for checking out our video! If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more additional content. If you have any ideas for a future video topic, please leave a comment and let me know what you would like to see me cover next. I'm really hoping to grow this channel and provide you all with more content in the future, and your support means the world to me. Thanks everyone!